This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Brown. The Age of Reason by Thomas Paine. Part 1st, Section 9. It is the structure of the universe that has taught this knowledge to man. That structure is an ever-existing exhibition of every principle upon which every part of mathematical science is founded. The offspring of this science is mechanics, for mechanics is no other than the principles of science applied practically. The man who proportions the several parts of a mill uses the same scientific principles as if he had the power of constructing a universe. But as he cannot give to matter that invisible agency by which all the component parts of the immense machine of the universe have influence upon each other and act in motional unison together without any apparent contact and to which man has given the name of attraction, gravitation, and repulsion he supplies the place of that agency by the humble imitation of teeth and cogs. All the parts of man's microcosm must visibly touch, but could he gain a knowledge of that agency so as to be able to apply it in practice, we might then say that another canonical book of the Word of God had been discovered. If man could alter the properties of the lever, so also could he alter the properties of the triangle, for a lever, taking that sort of lever which is called a steel yard for the sake of explanation, forms, when in motion, a triangle. The line it descends from, one point of that line being in the fulcrum, the line it descends to, and the chord of the arc, which the end of the lever describes in the air, are the three sides of a triangle. The other arm of the lever describes also a triangle, and the corresponding sides of those two triangles, calculated scientifically or measured geometrically, and also the sines, tangents, and secants generated from the angles and geometrically measured, have the same proportions to each other as the different weights have that will balance each other on the lever leaving the weight of the lever out of the case. It may also be said that man can make a wheel and axis, that he can put wheels of different magnitudes together and produce a mill. Still, the case comes back to the same point, which is that he did not make the principle that gives the wheels those powers. That principle is as unalterable as in the former case or rather it is the same principle under a different appearance to the eye. The power that two wheels of different magnitudes have upon each other is in the same proportion as if the semi-diameter of the two wheels were joined together and made into that kind of lever I have described, suspended at the part where the semi-diameters join. For the two wheels, scientifically considered, are no other than the two circles generated by the motion of the compound lever. It is from this study of the true theology that all our knowledge of science is derived, and it is from that knowledge that all the arts have originated. The almighty lecturer, by displaying the principles of science in the structure of the universe, has invited man to study and to imitation. It is as if he had said to the inhabitants of this globe that we call ours, I have made an earth for man to dwell upon, and I have rendered the starry heavens visible. To teach him science and the arts, he can now provide for his own comfort and learn from my munificence to all to be kind to each other. Of what use is it, unless it be to teach man something? that his eye is endowed with the power of beholding to an incomprehensible distance an immensity of worlds revolving in the ocean of space? Or of what use is it 
that this immensity of worlds is visible to man. What has man to do with the Pleiades, with Orion, with Sirius, with the star he calls the North Star, with the moving orbs he has named Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, and Mercury, if no uses are to follow from their being visible. A less power of vision would have been sufficient for man, if the immensity he now possesses were given only to waste itself, as it were, on an immense desert of space glittering with shows. It is only by contemplating what he calls the starry heavens as the book and school of science that he discovers any use in their being visible to him or any advantage resulting from his immensity of vision. But when he contemplates the subject in this light, he sees an additional motive for saying that nothing was made in vain. For in vain would be this power of vision if it taught man nothing as the Christian system of faith has made a revolution in theology, so also has it made a revolution in the state of learning. That which is now called learning was not learning originally. Learning does not consist, as the schools now make it consist, in the knowledge of languages, but in the knowledge of things to which language gives names. The Greeks were a learned people, but learning with them did not consist in speaking Greek any more than a Roman's speaking Latin, or a Frenchman's speaking French, or an Englishman's speaking English. From what we know of the Greeks, it does not appear that they knew or studied any language but their own, and this was one cause of their becoming so learned. It afforded them more time to apply themselves to better studies. The schools of the Greeks were schools of science and philosophy and not of languages. And it is in the knowledge of the things that science and philosophy teach that learning consists. Almost all the scientific learning that now exists came to us from the Greeks or the people who spoke the Greek language. It, therefore, became necessary for the people of other nations who spoke a different language that some among them should learn the Greek language, in order that the learning the Greeks had might be made known in those nations by translating the Greek books of science and philosophy into the mother tongue of each nation. The study, therefore, of the Greek language, and in the same manner for the Latin, was no other than the drudgery business of a linguist, and the language thus obtained was no other than the means, as it were the tools, employed to obtain the learning the Greeks had. It made no part of the learning itself, and was so distinct from it, as to make it exceedingly probable that the persons who had studied Greek sufficiently to translate those works, such, for instance, as Euclid's Elements, did not understand any of the learning the works contained. End of part nine.